So many people have had to fight through layers of religious trauma mm -hmm. and spiritual abuse. Yes, mm -hmm. and and that deep programming, particularly folks who are LGBTQ plus. Hey Amen, sister. <laughs> the self-loathing and self-hate. Yes, LGBTQ plus folks, but more than that, there's that's one of the systems of control is self-loathing and self-hate and so and shame these yes. are all things that are used to control people kind of my basis of understanding and filters of the world are church and christian faith yes and like broadway <laughs> theater <laughs> those are the two places that two raised worlds me are completely apart for some I people i don't think so <laughs> really? i don't think so at all hey everybody my name is lex and i'm here with pastor sarah robinson she is the pastor of audubon park church yes church yeah yes covenant church covenant church yeah. okay and i'm so happy and excited because i know we're gonna have a great conversation today. me too thank you for being with us yes, yes absolutely thank you for inviting me yes and here with us is also tony back there he's <laughs> <laughs> right got the new backdrop right there with the the lights the first encounter that i had with pastor sarah was at a rally mm -hmm. at the march for our dreams and freedoms mm -hmm. and you spoke and the way that you spoke reached me personally it felt like you were speaking to me Thank you. Um, because my, you know, I have, it's a long story and in this interview is to get to know you, mm -hmm. but to share it briefly, you know, I grew up in the church and, and I've said this before, I, I was, I was meant to be a pastor, you know, I had that calling I felt mm -hmm. that calling, uh, but I had a mixed experience in church, you know, and I, I divorced from the church, so to speak years ago. Mm -hmm. And mainly because I felt that I wasn't seen and understood and loved for who I am, mm -hmm. all that I am. Mm -hmm. um, it was just fully accepted. And to see a pastor speak to the crowd, a diverse crowd of um, immigrant families, you know, LGBTQ community represented there, just people of diverse backgrounds and walks of life, but with one intention, which was to make our voices heard, mm -hmm. that the laws that are being passed here in Florida that I have passed and that have been enacted uh, are unjust. unjust. And you spoke to that. And you spoke to that, to the fact that it's specifically the trans anti-trans laws were not uh, anything about Christ or or religion or faith. Yes. And you spoke forcefully. You did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. You did for me. This is what Jesus is calling us to. Love and care for the vulnerable. This is the important work that this amazing coalition of wonderful organizations who are participating today I stand here as a Christian and a pastor to say this. To pretend that these legislative acts are somehow a Christian agenda is a lie. This is an agenda of harm. This it is an agenda which will bring death. And your words were simple. They reached everyone in, in the space. And I just, I felt, I told Tony, I'm like, we need to speak with Pastor Sarah at some point. So thank you. I, I know that was long My pleasure. <laughs> My was, pleasure completely. You really touched me. So what compelled you to speak at, at the rally? Yeah. Well, one of your more recent guests, yes. Felipe, uh, is I'm on the board at Hope Community Center. Okay. And so I've gotten to know Felipe. He's come out and actually shared at our church on a Sunday morning before. Oh, wow. uh, and I work with him on a regular basis because I'm on the board there. And Felipe was one of the folks helping organize that event. Okay. And he asked me if I would share, if I would be a faith voice on that. There was really a broad range of okay. people that day yes. from very different backgrounds that represented kind of the whole round voice of people. Mm -hmm. And and so he entrusted me and I felt so honored that he entrusted me to bring a faith voice and perspective in that space. And he, mm -hmm. I think he knew he could trust me to share yes. uh, something that was in, in the spirit yes. of the day. So it was a little like, I was like, what do I say? I don't know. <laughs> I have an opportunity to represent. So how can I be clear for folks who have felt so rejected, who, mm -hmm. who have gotten a very different message from the church and people of faith? Mm -hmm. the, the most clear, simple things that I know to be true and, and, and I get an opportunity to say it clearly and loudly and more stri as straightforward as possible. And so that was my goal. Yes. So to hear that you received it in the way that I meant it is yes. the best. It, it felt authentic. And it was not only the words, but the tone. There was conviction 
behind it. Mm-hmm. And you could tell that this is not something that you were just saying to the crowd there, but that you truly believed and lived. And now to hear that you were part of the board, I mean, that speaks to your commitment to the community. You don't speak for all churches. You can only speak for your church and for what you're doing. But I wonder, because because you have gotten that, the Great Commission, right, in terms of this, you know, spreading the gospel mm. in the way that you are doing, which yes. is building community, uh, which is really, truly the way that it should be, right? Why is it that a lot of churches don't get that? Well, that, that yeah, it that is, is a big question. Yeah, you know, <laughs> why is it that it, they just don't get that? Mm. It is part of the work to build consensus, to find common ground. Uh, that we may not agree on everything. I'm sure that there are things that you may not agree with personally, yeah. but you're still there. I have discovered when I find myself in a really different place from a colleague or a, a fellow Christian that sometimes uh, our approach and understanding at our at the base, even to scripture, to a life of faith, comes from such a different place mm. that it's not surprising then that the output is really different too. It's the book is the book. Yes. Neutral isn't quite the right word, but it is what it is. Yes. It's complex. There are great things. There are things that we don't love about it. And I think that's true for everybody. Yes. But then part of the honesty that we need to bring when we look at it and then how we live our, out the faith mm-hmm. is that we all pick and choose things. We all bring interpretive ideas and lenses, our own life experiences, history, Mm -hmm. education, all of that to bear. And, and so, you know, there's lots of, there's all kinds of people in the world. So there's all kinds of interpretations. And so it's a, it's something I've struggled and puzzled over. Like, how can we read the same thing and come to such very (laughs) dramatically different conclusions, giving space uh, to people and and going, I'm going to assume this is like coming in to relationship to conversation with people. Mm-hmm. I'm going to come from a place that says we are we are thinking the best of one another. Yes, and approaching any conversation, any engagement with somebody with that. I love that. If it doesn't prove out, then okay, you know. <laughs> then we know. Yeah, there's freedom in just being who you are, mm-hmm. and and I think the way I always think about it is like he gave us free will, right? To do as we as we see fit in our lives, and and there's some guides, right? The Bible is is deemed to be a guide, but that people should be given the choice whether to subscribe to it or not. You can't force it on people. Forcing people is antithetical to who I understand God to be at the most base of whatever people want to term God. The universe, right? You know? The universe. I'm like fine. <laughs> use the terms you want, but I fundamentally understand God to be a loving being mm. and love in the purest form. That is self-sacrificing, self-giving, never forcing anyone ever. And so as soon as people get to a place where they are saying God might be forcing someone to do this or that, or the church is forcing people to do this or that inside inside the church or outside of it, to me, huge red flag automatically Flag on the play, whatever you want to say. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not really a sports no, ball person, either. but <laughs> a flag on the field. Flag on the field. <laughs> I think that's you know, some we have to examine that, yeah. check ourselves because love does not force. Love gives freedom and choice, mm. and I see God ultimately as that highest example of of that kind of love, and I believe that Scripture bears that out. Right, and that there's consequences obviously to every action that we take in this life. Uh, for good or for bad, but that it is up to each individual to make that choice. And when we start to restrict the options, right, that's where we run into trouble with maybe legislating what love means in terms of what the church should express toward society, right? Yes, yes, (laughs) absolutely. You mentioned that the ways that we decide how to apply our understanding of of faith or the Bible or faith is through how we were uh, brought up. A lot of times, right? Mm -hmm. So, because I know that we did a little bit of research and you have an elementary, you know, uh, education background, so do I. Yes. And uh, the way I always start conversations is I always think about the little person, like the little, Mm -hmm. you know, Felipe. Mm -hmm. And I ask them the same questions. Mm -hmm. Tell me a a little bit more about little Sarah. Little Sarah um, was an only child up until almost seven. Okay. And was very precocious very outgoing, uh, you know, spoke at a very early age, was surrounded by adults. So just thought, you know, talking with adults like adults was a very normal 
normal thing yeah. and I n- never met a room or a conversation that I didn't want to be in and be a part of. Uh, so that is definitely little Sarah. Yes. Just love everything. Love animals. Uh, I thought I maybe wanted to be a veterinarian at one point. Okay. And, and then later I thought I wanted to be an environmental lawyer. That's what I went into college thinking I was going to do. Okay. I study environmental law. I mean, you start hearing the background that kind of yeah, connects the dots. I can see. When, yeah. Yes. I grew up doing theater. All right. Uh, and singing in church. I mean, kind of my basis of understanding and filters of the world are like church and Christian faith. Yes. And like Broadway <laughs> theater, <laughs> those are the two places that two raised me. Are completely apart for some I people. I don't think so. <laughs> really? I don't think so at all. I think truth mm. is often found best in telling of stories, mm. and even more sometimes you can get at greater truth in the telling of fictional stories. Then you get compelling truth about what matters in life. You Why know, do you think how that? we should act? Um, that's a good question. I think when you're, when you're focused on maybe telling a true story that you feel bound to some set of facts Yes. and like, Oh, I have to tell it this way. Uh, and so, uh, and it's very complex often. We can't really get that complexity through when we tell stories. Yes. But in my experience, and I've thought a lot about storytelling, Mm -hmm. I have Irish background. And so storytelling is, you know, in the bones, I think, and been passed down and, uh, yes, I, th- I often experience and I have witnessed and seen the power of a fiction story to get at a deeper truth mm. much more effectively than a nonfiction story, which is there for information. There are different requirements of a nonfiction story, of what makes a nonfiction story that, that, uh, I think real people's stories are and real people are quite complex. Mm-hmm. And so figuring out how to tell an honest nonfiction story, I think you have to sometimes sacrifice some of the things that can bring themes out, can help tell those bigger truths mm-hmm. and things like that, that, that fiction can, it's not bound in the same way. So you're allowed to simplify, to bring out and clarify yes. bigger, deeper truths. And I think, uh, there's a term and I don't remember who, who term, who gave, you know, coined this term, but yeah. of a holy imagination. Mm. I think fiction allows us to, to dream and, and so put ourselves in a place of, of like dreaming what could be Mm -hmm. that allows ourselves to actually have that holy imagination to live into what could be instead of just what is. Yes. And, And I think that's, that's important. It is necessary. Yes. That has hope and love and faith. All of that is bound up yeah. in it. And and so that's why I think fiction is really, really powerful. Do you think this is why there's a there's a concerted effort mm. to stifle that creativity and media and the movies and Disney even? I think there are many reasons yeah. for it. Fascism, mm-hmm. movements to try to limit people's access to information ultimately are because that information brings freedom, knowledge and freedom. Uh, and so I think it's more than just that, but of course that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, when the kinds of stories that we can be told, that we can tell, that are retold and retold are limited, the more limited, the more limited we will be. Yes. And so we need all the diversity of all the kinds of stories being told with as much specificity as possible uh, to be able to get at the, even try to get at the breadth of human experience and life as we know it and purpose and all of that. So what was your favorite kind of play and your roles? What Mm. roles did you play? I'm just curious. When I was very young. Yes. My favorite thing to act, no matter what time of year, and we're talking like two years old, three years old, very young. So when kids do a lot of imagining and playing things, I like to play the nativity story and be merry. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. So I had, I would always use my security blanket and and then I never really played dolls like girls are supposed to pay dolls, but I had one and I would use it to play baby Jesus. Sometimes I'd recruit my dad to be Joseph, but you know, Joseph's like not that important to the story. So. <laughs> He's just, you know, filler. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. That's awesome. So I, I was just going to ask you next, did your parents encouraged this and then they, they allowed you to express yourself freely. Absolutely. That's yeah. wonderful. 
Yeah. And, uh, never, never kind of had any limits to how you were no, expressing uh, yourself. No. I mean, so my mom grew up doing theater. Oh, okay. So. It, like her whole family. It was like a family project. She grew up in a small town in Illinois, DeKalb, Illinois. And the community theater, they all participated, the whole family, in different places. And so that's what she she grew up doing. Okay. And, and so she actually went to college thinking she was going to do theater. She ended up switching to religious studies, oh. getting a religious studies degree. Look at that. Yes. My father um, grew up one of 10 kids. Uh, he's number six of 10, the last boy. And yeah. he um, thought he wanted to study environmental science, went actually to college for environmental science. Okay. Thought he was going to maybe be like a ranger out in the park somewhere, park ranger or something okay. like that. Met my mom. She's like not an outdoors person. So <laughs> kind of changed his plan a little bit. All right. Uh, and I should, that's a little unfair to her. <laughs> she's like, you know, her idea of camping is a hotel though. Yeah. That, glamping. She's at, glamping. Yeah, well, I don't think she could no. even do camping. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he also always uh, worked from the time he was like, I don't know, 12 or 13 and paid his way through college as one of 10 children you would have to. Yes. Um, by working at the student newspaper in advertising. And oh. that's actually what he ended up doing for a career. Oh. Yes. And so I am a. Like kind of a big mix of. That's my what I'm parents. seeing. I'm picking up on the themes here. <laughs> yes, I'm. A, I'm like a, a perfect amalgam of my parents' background and, and also, you know, I call them like Christian hippies. Oh. And so <laughs> that you know, we always like recycled, lived very like you know, environmentally humbly, conscious. Environmentally conscious. Mm. Uh, you know, my mom was a vegetarian before she met my dad, and so we we always you know ate very simply and uh, composted, like you know, and grew food. All those very type of progressive things. in that regard. Now. Right. So I grew up in Northeast Indiana, which is not a particularly progressive place, but right. that was my own context. That, that's that. what I know that's as my own context. So I didn't only grow up in the church. Okay. I went to the school attached to my church from nursery school through eighth grade. So like, uh, like, like we know now, like academies that are oh, well, parochial, oh, like, like a kind of parochial school. Yeah. Okay. So like how Catholic schools yeah. might have, but this was Christian Academy, uh, like yes, essentially. Yes. yes. Okay. So yeah. what was that experience like? It was great. Okay. And I, I don't think everybody would have a great experience. Right. My school is very unique. First of all, it was a, from the start, a more progressive, okay. the more progressive, it was the only one. So okay. my hometown is like a hotbed of Missouri Synod Lutheran conservatism. There's an enormous amount of Catholics, enormous amount of conservative Lutherans. We were the only ELCA affiliate, like school affiliated. Okay. There was a bunch of like, I don't know, 15 Lutheran grade schools, maybe more. Mm -hmm. So it was a very normal experience for me. What would be mo to most people a very unique experience yeah. was very normalized. Like we had our own bus system and played each other in sports. That's how big of a Lutheran school system there was. Okay. We were the outcast school that was, was like a liberal ask, progressive like, school. Were you treated like that differently? Do you yes. have friends outside of the circles of Yes, because like the kids we wouldn't know. But you know, there was something called Lutheran Schools Week where we'd all go to the Lutheran high school. Mm -hmm. That was also Missouri Senate, the conservative. And there would be questions about if we could participate the people from my school and church could participate in the activities because mm -hmm. like, I don't know, your kindergartner might infect my kindergartner with bad doctrine. Really? I mean, it was like, should they be able to ride the bus? Yeah. With, I mean, it was like that. So wow. I definitely like left Fort Wayne with a bit of a chip on my shoulder because this was the context I was in all the way through graduating from high schools. Cause I went on to the Lutheran high school as well. Yes. So where this is your whole education. My whole education. Basically. Through and I experience. went to a Lutheran college. You did. Valparaiso University. You doubled down on it. Well, it ended up being the right place for me. <laughs> for sure. No, it sounds like it. Yeah. Even though, because what I'm getting at is you, you, you lived through that experience of, like you said, um, sort of feeling like an outcast in a way. Because because you were surrounded by so many communities that were more predominantly conservative. Yes. But so. my home and my church were very safe spaces where I was encouraged to flourish. I love that. So I didn't experience that in my personal life. Yes. I knew it you were existed. Aware of it. I was very aware yes. of it because we talked about all of that. Yes. Things were not kept from us. My parents talked us through everything. Yes. And so it wasn't, I was not unaware of it, but it didn't actually affect me personally. Yes. Like there were a few of us that from the grade school that went into the high school that were all in like the religion indoctrination class mm -hmm. in, in high school. And, yeah. and I mean, 
that was their own fault. They put it, the other two girls. <laughs> it was the three of us w- women. Yeah. Which in the Missouri Senate, women have a very secondary. Like they can't mm-hmm. be pastors. They can't teach over men. Yes. Like very. Yes. I'm so we had a professor, yeah. a teacher, sorry, high school, uh-huh. who ha- was charged with like indoctrinate teaching the doctrine of the this conservative doctrine. The other two women all had girls had lawyers for parents and were very smart and well informed. And then me with my my particular background. Yes. Uh, and he didn't know what to do. Like we were constantly talking him into corners. And everybody else in the class is like, oh yeah, why is that the way it was? Like we didn't put up with it. And we knew enough to be able to articulate why that was not the only way you could understand yes. a particular thing. I mean, that's exactly what they were afraid of, right? That, you, well, of that they would ask questions. Of course, yes, yes. yes. It was yeah. all about producing little mini me's. Yes, it was not about people having self-expression, which was so opposite. Yes, of what I, how I was raised, how I was taught, where we were taught a, a live face of faith, and mm-hmm. a live faith is a questioning faith. That means you're mm-hmm. engaged. That, that was how I was raised. With doubt, right around there, right? Doubt <laughs> questions, just that you don't have to have it all figured out. Right, and and if you're just taking everything as you're being fed, then are you really engaged with it? Mm-hmm. So just a total opposite experience for me. Mm-hmm. I grew up in that the other side, which mm-hmm. is very strict. Um, what I've come to realize is that my experience, and, and again, I, I when I share this, and I haven't shared a lot of my experience in the podcast or the show yet, but it's I've come to realize that I was in a cult, mm-hmm. essentially, because oh, wow. there was a lot of mechanisms to prevent you from being exposed to any other thinking. It's the same techniques. Yeah. Is, yeah. Like the control is mm-hmm. the same, whether we're talking about people trying to put government control, yes. what, church control, school control over information, mm-hmm. all of it's, it's the same behaviors that are happening in all of those spaces. And that idea that you're in the right you're in the wrong, mm-hmm. right? That I'm in the right, and I'm sure that the the, the, the Missouri Senate, Missouri Senate, yeah, um, felt that way. Like we're in the For right, sure. you know. They're For in sure. the wrong. They're they're more liberal. They're not really. Eh, they might be Christians, maybe, eh, you know. And that whole idea it, it divides the community of faith. Right? Yes, which divide and conquer. Right, dividing people, putting walls up, mm-hmm. is the way you win over them. Where you have power of tried and tried and two. Tried and true technique. A hundred percent. Again, these are all the same techniques, whether it's a I mean, it's yes. all the same. Yeah. It's, it's power over, it's control, mm-hmm. uh, it's limiting information, it's limiting choice, mm-hmm. it's manipulation yes. of, of information. I mean, and yeah, it's, it's all the same. And it's all, and it's all basically at the root is fear. Yes. 100%. There is this fear. Why, why fear? Well, yeah. there's this fear because... Well, the way that I learned, uh, fear of God, but it's a very, very misconstrued concept of fear. Yes. It's not like oh, afraid, you it's more know, like awe, awe, you know, and respect and, and reverence, right? That's the way it should be. But like the 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 reason why I realized that it was a cult, it was because it was it was founded upon one individual. The, mm. the pastor was the end all be all. You know, yes. Um, and, and in so, these systems, that's often also the case. Yeah, there's a very strict hierarchy. Mm-hmm. There is a person that is everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So knowing that you have the, the opposite experience, it makes sense that you live a life today where you are open, right, to serving the community the way that we were called to do as a church, right? Um, and, and it makes sense. It, it, what you said earlier is that that informs your understanding of your faith, that informs your understanding of scripture yes. and how you apply it. Yes, absolutely. That's where I was getting to yes. there asking you all those questions. Yes, 100%. <laughs> yes. That's why it's possible for me to have lived it so differently. Yes. I'm very fortunate that I have not had to fight my way there like so many mm-hmm. people have. So many people have had to fight through layers of religious trauma mm-hmm. and spiritual abuse. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and that deep programming, particularly folks who are LGBTQ+. Plus, they, Amen, there's, deep, <laughs> there's deep stuff mm-hmm. that's foundational. Mm-hmm. Then that's you have to tear so much down to get down to the root, to root that out, yes. to start fresh. Mm-hmm. Boy, it's no wonder people can't always like build it back up. It's it hard. makes sense. It's or hard. even get down there in one lifetime to root all that out. I know for so many people, the self-loathing and self-hate, yes, LGBTQ plus folks, but more than that, there's that's one of the systems of control mm-hmm. is self-loathing and self-hate. Absolutely. And so, and shame, these yes. are all 
things that are used to control people. And and so that's that's they want that for everybody. They want everybody to feel that. Yes. They want women to feel that. That they want men to feel that in different ways. Mm-hmm. They they want LGBTQ anybody who's different to feel yes. that. Right. Yes. They want all those. They want because that's a ma- that's a means of control. Yeah. If you're too worried about those things, you're not really questioning what the leadership is doing. Yeah. Well, that definitely speaks to my experience. I mean, I feel very seen when you share that because that is the way that it was um, visited upon me and my experience was I I love God. And to this day, I can say that. And I can say that now with a heart that has gone through a lot of the healing personally. And it's all it's been a lot of personal work, like because, you know, you would think, oh, then I I should go to my pastor to help me. But that was not it. (laughs) That was not the answer. It was not. No, 100 percent. That was tried and that was that failed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, you know, and then coming out of the church and knowing that there were aspects of it that make me who I am having grown up in church Mm -hmm. that I'm not that I don't regret. Mm. Um, I regret the the parts that that hurt me. But at the same time, I've learned from those things and they make me who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's been a few years in the making of being able to feel forgiveness for them Mm -hmm. or or at least accepted Mm -hmm. um, and be able to speak to Mm -hmm. a pastor, knowing that not everyone, not every church is made the same way. Not every pastor um, behaves the same way. Yeah. Um, and that's a given because I, you, you just have to just step out into the world and know that not everyone, you know, behaves or believes in the same way. And I can't control no. their way that they act and they're right? Right. just like, right. we can't control, like we can only control what we do in the spaces we work in and we create. Yes. That's what we can control. And there are so many people in the LGBT community who identify with my story. I know that that's that's what's given me comfort in some ways that I'm not alone in that experience. Have you had to encounter a lot of people who've come from, you know, come from the LGBTQ community who come to you and have attended your church and, and are looking for healing in that regard? Yeah, what I will tell you is the conversation about inclusivity is the conversation I have with every person that approaches me about whether they might attend or not, mm. what our church is like. Etc. Like it, the conversation, without fail, yeah, is like, is that a safe space? Mm-hmm. That's that's the question that's asked, mm-hmm. and and uh, so it's so much. Not even just for LGBTQ folks, but right. parents who want to raise humans, little humans who are accepting and loving mm-hmm. and inclusive, and uh, and so it's it's the it's the number one question yes. that when people approach me about maybe attending church, about what our church is like, about me, et cetera. Number one question. Um, And I have been so blessed to be on a journey where I've gotten to hear so many people's stories, friends, people in the community, um, you know, uh, stories on television, like Pose and things like that. Like there's, you can learn from everywhere. And especially in the internet age, there's no excuse to not be able to try to see something from somebody else's point of view. Amen. So (laughs) there's no excuse. Absolutely. There's, there is enough out there. There, I mean, there's a lot out there. There's maybe not enough yet. There's more stories to tell, but there's a lot of material out there. On the next episode, how do you speak to an evangelical Christian who says there is no way to Mm -hmm. reconcile Mm -hmm. being an advocate for the LGBT community Mm -hmm. and being a spiritual, you know, leader, your role is you are to speak and to correct and to call out uh, sin Mm -hmm. for what it is Mm -hmm. uh, because it is sin. And, And we love the sinner. We don't love the sin. If you like our content, make sure you subscribe to our channel and like our videos.